welcome back to the Balanced Blonde Podcast, Soul on Fire. And if this is your first time listening, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. I am especially excited and honored to be joined today by my guest, Rachel Ricketts. You may know her as a racial justice educator, a healer, a speaker, an author, a death doula, which is fascinating. And we get into that in the episode spiritual activist and beyond. Rachel's platforms on Instagram and social media have skyrocketed just in the last couple weeks alone, which is something that we talk about in the episode as well, because it's always awesome to grow, but also coming off of what's going on in our world right now with Black Lives Matter and this movement and the tragic deaths of many people in the Black community. Um, It's an interesting kind of catch-22, and we talk about that in the episode as well. And I just have to shout out so many listeners of The Balanced Wand for recommending that I look into Rachel's work because you guys know me really well. The second that I looked her up and started doing her courses, I've done her Spiritual Activism 101 and 102. I instantly felt a connection to her. She's such a good teacher. She's so spiritually aligned. She's in her passion, in her truth, in her spiritual fullness. And like I told her in this conversation, she's truly living her soul on fire life by combining so many of her passions and so much of her education from being a lawyer to studying racial justice in school, and so much more. And now she, as of today, when we recorded this episode, she had 201,000 followers on Instagram. Those of you who follow me know 201 is the number, the number of my angels, my guides. Listen to the numerology episode if you want to hear more. And I'm sure by the time this episode comes out, Rachel's platform will only be bigger because she is growing and teaching and educating and her message is so important and needs to be heard and amplified in as many places as possible. So I know the Balanced Blonde listeners are super interested in spirituality as well as super interested in being better people, learning, doing the deep work, doing the shadow work. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt, haha, shadow of a doubt, that doing this work, doing Rachel's work has been so eye-opening, so awakening. I've loved it. It hasn't always been fun um, in the sense that doing shadow work is never fun and facing truths about white supremacy and being a white woman with white ancestry and being a white person and also not being fully awake or aware of this work until recently, which is something I take complete ownership for. Um, There's a lot to unpack. So we talk about that in the episode and I'm excited for you guys to hear it and to hear all of Rachel's learnings and teachings. I also just wanted to get to know Rachel as a person and have her share more of her story and her life with us. We talk about boundaries and energy and how she's taking care of herself during this time and always. We talk about her growing her team. We talk about her human design and her astrology and more. So I'm very excited for you guys to hear this episode. I'm also very grateful for Rachel um, taking the time to come on the Balanced Bond podcast, especially during this complete revolution that we're experiencing amidst all of the loss and grief and shift that our world is experiencing. So her coming on is, is so appreciated by me. I know it's appreciated by all of you guys are fabulous listeners. And I promise my pledge is that this is only the beginning of sharing more diverse voices on the podcast and a greater range that needs to be heard. That is part of what it means to be in the wellness world and in the spiritual world. And I have had my eyes opened. I feel so much more awake, so much more proud of even who I am as a person after doing 
Rachel's courses. And that's the only, the very beginning. And I recognize that is the bare, bare, bare minimum. It's the beginning of lifelong work. And as a person, as a spiritual teacher, as a healer, as a channeler, as a human, as a soul wrapped in skin, I fully, fully, fully acknowledge that this is lifelong work. I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to know Rachel and to have had this chat with her and to continue connecting with her in the future. So if you've come over here because you are already a fan of Rachel, then I hope and believe that this conversation will be fun for you to learn to learn more about her and hear her spreading her message. And if you're here just learning about Rachel for the first time, I'm so excited to share her with you. And I highly recommend supporting her, checking out her workshops. Um, if you are a white person, if you are a person of color, however you identify, she has different options for different people. I can imagine they're all very potent and very powerful. I know the ones that I've taken are. And I can't wait to see what else she continues to come up with. So let's support her, check her out, follow her, tell her that you came from the Balance Blonde fam and show her that TBB love. Before we dive into the episode, I wanted to take a second to thank our sponsor for today's show, Hum Nutrition. Hum Nutrition is my favorite beauty supplement company. I want you to first know that you can use the code SOUL, S-O-U-L, for 20% off of all Hum Nutrition products. Hum Nutrition has been featured in Forbes. They've been featured on Mind Body Green, Well and Good, Vogue, Allure, all over the place. We gave out Hum Nutrition supplements in our wedding gift bag because that's how big of a fan we are. I take the Mighty Night supplement every night. It helps me sleep. I suffer from severe insomnia. For people listening, they already know, but if you're new here, my insomnia issue is out of control, but taking Mighty Night helps me sleep so much. It's full of just natural vegan supplements from the earth like valerian root and many other ingredients that are all natural, organic, non-GMO, third-party tested, pure and potent, super easy on the system. You can shop by category like immunity, skin, hair, body, mood, vegan, um, or you can take a little quiz if you're unsure of where to begin with supplements and they will pair you with a registered dietitian who will help you find the products and the supplements that are best for you and for your body. I highly recommend during this time specifically with everything that we are all feeling, we are all empathic, we are all going through a lot, the big chill. Big Chill is full of rhodiola, which is an adaptogen that helps to balance the adrenals and helps balance stress and helps the body manage stress. Um, I also love and I have always loved their daily cleanse, which helps get rid of toxins that can cause breakouts. It helps aid digestion, support detoxification. It's full of ingredients like chlorella, beetroot, dandelion, zinc, selenium, manganese, copper, all of these wonderful things that our bodies need to thrive. So however you eat, whether it is totally healthy or maybe not so much, usually most of us, especially women, can benefit from the power of supplementation, especially healthy supplementation that we trust that is non-GMO, organic, vegan, all the things. So check them out at humnutrition.com. Use the code SOUL at checkout for 20% off and enjoy. Tag me on Instagram when you try them out. And now let's head into this episode with the fabulous anti-racist educator, Rachel Ricketts. Rachel, I am so happy to have you here on the podcast today. I'm just a huge fan of your work and only wish that I had found you sooner, but I'm thrilled that I found you now and that you're here chatting with us on Soul on Fire. So if you could just start by, first of all, telling us, how are you? There's so much going on right now. How are you? How's your heart? How are you feeling? Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. 
check in. Uh, it's really moment by moment, but I just had a really beautiful call with my team. Um, to really small but mighty group of phenomenal women and just came out of like a really obviously it's it's a really intense time collectively uh especially for black people like one of my responses sometimes when people are like how are you i'm like i'm black so that's 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 how i am right. and also this really last week was this just and i mean obviously still continuing into this week this uh, the conflict that arises in being someone who is a you know, black woman identified anti-racist educator and activist in this moment of heightened hyper collective awakening specifically from white women. And so it's like racism is good for business, which is, which is disgusting, right? Like it feels, and obviously it's like, I'm here to get the medicine out, but just holding that conflicting experience Mm -hmm. has been a real challenge. And then also just just I'm I'm an empath and intuitive and um to hold space like my audience I don't know grew like quadrupled yeah right in like five days so that energetically is a lot is a lot in a time when you're just trying you're you're grieving you know the death of more black lives and the the uprising that results which has so much hope and opportunity in it but just knowing that it always has to come at the expense of black lives and like the the the, the exhaustion and grief and fatigue and frustration and anger that comes as a result of that so lots of conflicting feelings so i feel in this moment i feel grounded and i feel hopeful and i also feel uh sad i feel sad and yeah, it's be it's it's exhausted. It's like beyond exhaustion because it's right. like this bone bone tiredness of the, the fact we even have to be here, right? The fact we even have to get to this moment, being grateful we're in it, and yet like you know that it had to take this to get here is, right. is bone a bone tiring experience. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I feel you. I feel your words. I feel your honesty. I want to start by talking about what you mentioned, how your audience has pretty much quadrupled over the last couple of weeks, week with everything going on. How does that feel? Because (laughs) there's so many more people now um, doing your courses, you know, coming to you. And I know you've been really vocal about do not, you know, slide into your DMs and ask you questions and that's not your job. So it's probably challenging to juxtapose all these feelings. Like your business is thriving. People are coming to you. You're educating on a topic that's so important. Yet you have your own energy boundaries to protect. So Mm -hmm. what does that look like? Spirit will do it. So spirit has been, you know, guiding me, (laughs) leading me towards this for a long time. And I knew that this was coming. I just didn't know it was coming this way or, or at this time. So I have been getting more and more fierce and protective of my boundaries doing this work. The more you do this work and the more healing you do, the more you realize like that you get to prioritize yourself and that I can't actually do this work unless I'm prioritizing myself and how that's been a real challenge as a woman identified person, as a black woman identified person who literally like within my inherited trauma and inherited, you know, genetic code is to serve others, specifically to serve whiteness, literally to work myself to death. My ancestors literally had to work themselves to death. So rest is incredibly hard. It's still an ongoing journey. Uh, but I'm grateful that I've been able to do the amount of work that I've been able to do before I got to this point so that when I got here, I could be like, okay. So my overarching feeling is this. This is a, I've been saying this repeatedly. This is not a moment. This is a movement. So this is like, you know, nothing that I'm saying or any other black activist or other activist is saying right now hasn't been said before. We're saying the exact same thing we've been saying for centuries, literally. And it's this this energetic shift in this like hypersensitive, hypervigilant, like I mentioned, collective awakening that's resulting in all of these things lining up and all of this attention being put, put on this issue. Like, you know, this double kind of interception of things happening with the pandemic and then this what I call literal black genocide within a pandemic and the pandemic, the coronavirus as a pandemic already was a black genocide in America. And then this on top of it. Um, So all of these things had to happen and be stacked in this very specific way in order to get us to where we are in this moment and to have all of this. So to have people be like, Oh, okay, now I'm paying attention feels again, like, okay, there's opportunity there, but it also feels frustrating. Like, again, I'm not saying anything different. Nobody is, 
yes, this is a very exceptional time in terms of that like layering of things, but in terms of being a black person, in terms of the oppression that the black community faces, not much has changed. It just is heightened, like I mentioned. So that feels frustrating. And then, yeah, to have all of this attention energetically, I had to get really fierce about, again, my why, like why I do this work. And so I do this for everybody, but for no one more than Black and Indigenous women and femmes. And that includes gender nonconforming, non-binary, trans, intersex, genderqueer folks. So if that's the case, then I have to to continually come back to my why. So my audience quadrupled. And I, my understanding is the majority of those people are white women. And that's great. And I'm glad that people are here, but my priority will still be prioritizing the, the well-being and comfort and healing and safety uh, and livelihoods of, in this specific moment, in this specific moment, particularly Black women and identified, women identified people, myself included. So one of the main things about people sliding into my DM, and all of this is you know, all of this goes so deep. So it's like, I, I want to do the work and I'm here to do the work and people wanting to off white women really wanting to offload their experience on me, which is just asking me to do more work and not about me. Like that's not trying to further my comfort or well being or the ca- the safety of black people that is trying to assuage your guilt and make yourself feel better. And that it's so loaded. Cause that's what folks are like. That's the experience that white folks are used to having. So I, I have compassion for it and I appreciate where they're coming from. And like, I'm not here for it. I'm not going to help. I'm not going to perpetuate in that. Um, and I can't do this work unless I am taking care of myself. I can't hold space for anyone if I'm not holding space for myself. So I've had to get way more fierce with my boundaries And also the way that I operate is from an anti-oppressive lens in all ways. This isn't just about race, although I believe like racial justice requires an end to all forms of oppression because they're all intersected. So cis heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, um, homophobia, like all of these things are interconnected. And so I have to, I don't have to do anything, but I do my best to operate in a way that is um, counter to all of those forces so even in terms of running a business and people being like i bought this and i want it now and i'm like you can fucking wait like you took you 300 years to get here you can wait another couple of days i have to prioritize i'm doing the best i can it's a small team right and all of this is tied into these systems of oppression like well i bought it and i deserve it and i'm entitled and i'm ready to do it now and it's like again who are you here for are you here for black liberation or are you here to make yourself feel better in this moment and not just white folks like you know non-black folks all, all around. So, um, it's been a journey for sure. I'm glad that I have been in a place where I have bolstered my boundaries before being in this place, but this has also really been an opportunity to, um, get clear about those and just remind everyone like, this is my livelihood. This is also my life. This is my lived experience. So whether I did this for work or not, this would be deeply impacting. And I also had my community grow four times, you know, fourfold and have all of these new eyes, all of this new energy, all of this white gaze, really, that's what this compounded and all of these requests and demands and attention for my time in the midst of deep, deep, deep grief for me as a black person. Right. So um, instead of you doing, doing like a classic cis hetero capitalist thing of just pretending like none of that matters and just making sure that customers come first or like whiteness and white people come first and that I'm serving them and making sure that they they get the information. I'm like, no, I'm going to prioritize myself, my little team, our rest, our well-being, uh, because this isn't a moment. This is a movement. We've been doing this for a really long time. We plan on continuing to do this for a really long time. So what is it we need in order to make that happen? Um, And part of that is, is again, like shifting this entire system of oppression that comes in all forms, even just this notion of people being like, I bought this and want it now. It's like this, this demand or entitlement. And yeah. Wow. Well, that, that's incredible. I think you've done a really good job from what I've been following along with, with you of educating and being compassionate and all these things that you are as a human and also really fiercely protecting your boundaries and explicitly stating what your boundaries are and it's very admirable so I just wanted to yeah to let you know that that inspires me a lot and I've learned a lot from you um just in this short time of taking your courses spiritual activism 101 102 so I want to get into that and have you share with our audience what is spiritual activism 
And also, how did you get started on this path? I have so many questions, but about <laughs> your life specifically, how, let's start with how did you get started on this path of spiritual activism? Yeah, thanks. I'm like always, you, I've answered this question so many times, so I'm still like, where do I start? So it started before when I was in the womb of my mother, you know, like truly. And all of it's a culmination of all my personal and professional experiences. But I will say it, I guess, compounded after the death of my mother in 2015 and supporting her transition. She had um, primary progressive multiple sclerosis and I'm an only child. She was a single parent. And the realization of the fact of, you know, the medical racism that we experienced and all of the systems of oppression that led us to be in the situation that we arrived at, which was a moment of her deciding that she wanted to transition and not being supported and me needing to advocate for her uh, right to, to die with dignity. So um, I'm Canadian, born and raised in Canada. And so we have access to healthcare, which is a wild thing to think of uh, for Americans. Yeah. Uh, and I'm in, it's a real privilege and really it shouldn't be, but it is. And I'm really grateful for that. But even within that system of having that access and privilege, we still were met with so much um, oppression institutionally. And that was really heightened when she was in this space of wanting to to transition because she hadn't been supported as she needed to be along the way. So she got to this place where she was just in so much pain chronically that wouldn't end that she was like, this is, I need to be free from this body. Like there's nothing else that can be done on this plane now. And so I fully supported her in that, but the medical institution didn't. And, you know, experiences that we had that I don't believe we would have had had we not been Black women again, like in that moment of trying to, of helping her transition and then all of the experiences that we had along the way in terms of medical system and the social welfare state and all of these things, like the support that we just didn't get that led us to that place. So after she passed, I felt this massive amount of grief, obviously, as anyone can and imagine losing a parent, losing your only parent, and also realizing that I had all of the grief that I had experienced all the way all along the way, all the loss, all the losses that had happened of like loss of motherhood. You know, I, I became her like primary caretaker, all of the losses we experienced as a result of oppression and discrimination. And all of that hit me at once, like a ton of bricks. So I, I missed my, the physical presence of my mom on this plane, but then I also was grieving all of this, all of this loss and pain that arose all at once. And I realized nothing has caused me more harm than um, like white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchy and all institutions of oppression and the ways they intersect and have caused me and my mother harm. So when I really sat with that, I became a death doula and grief coach to support folks through grief. I feel like we don't have conversations about grief or conflicting feelings or, you know, hard, the hard shit. But very quickly, I realized that um, because the most grief I've ever experienced as a result, nothing in my life has not been impacted quite significantly by the intersection of my race and gender identity. And people kept asking me to have this conversation. And so I was in a place where I also had the privilege of being able to really uh, put my healing, prioritize my healing. And so I quickly got to a place of realizing the work is actually um, returning to my work of anti-racism. Like I have been, I have a degree and diploma in intercultural education and training, which is a very Canadian term for anti-racism. <laughs> And I went to law school to do international human rights and social justice and all of that stuff. So it's always been been within me, but I didn't feel like I had capacity to, to take it up in arms in the way that I had wanted to because I had a sick parent that I needed to care for. And so with her passing and in light of her an hour shared experience um, and my ability to really sit with that experience and what was needed for me to heal my own heart and the experiences of what was continuing on, the experience of what I was continuing to have and how, again, my race and gender identity were impacted by that. I came back to this work, this racial justice work in a really big way. And part of that was also technology-based. I mean, being able to witness, I grew up in a very white community. And by white community, I mean, we had a very large East Asian population, but it was like very segregated and it was still very much dominated by whiteness and wealthy whiteness at that. And so I grew up in very traumatizing violent spaces and never felt sufficiently safe to have, like really do the work that I, that I didn't feel safe to do my own work because I was in these violent spaces and to not, like there was no one I felt like I could have a conversation with. And so to be in, in existence on this planet now and have access to, you know, I have a love hate with Instagram, but being able to see black women lead the way and pave the way and speak this way would, was a real blessing. And that isn't to say I wasn't already, you know, reading like Audre Lorde's and Maya Angelou's and 
Angela Davis and learning from them, but to see people like my age in this era saying these things vocally now in this moment really also ignited me in a really major way to, to refind and reclaim my voice. And a lot of the, again, the grief feeling that I did, that was all internal work. And the more inner healing I did, the more I realized how much this needs to happen and that my playing so small and internalizing my own oppression and allowing sil silencing myself and allowing um, others, white people in my life to be silent about these issues was causing me so much harm and that as part of my healing that, that that couldn't I wouldn't allow that to occur anymore that couldn't continue to happen wow that that's an amazing story and I love hearing how you've really your whole journey has blended together to create what you do now which is what I love that's kind of what this podcast is about soul on fire people who live a soul on fire life who are able to combine so many passions and life experiences and and truly make work out of it. And it's your life work. It's who you are. So I admire that so much. And I was reading about um, you and your mom this morning, some experiences I was reading that you've written and just, wow, my heart was exploding. And I, I have chronic Lyme disease, which was almost misdiagnosed many times as MS. Mm. And mm. I just feel, I feel it so deeply in the pain. And I just want to acknowledge that, that part of your story. And just, I feel your mom, I feel your mom in you. And I think, you know, just incredible, like what you have learned and taken and, and what you share now. And what a fascinating passing of your mom and, and mm. the support that you gave her. So if you're comfortable talking a little bit about that, that's a topic mm. I've never discussed on the podcast and, and even really with anyone, um, the way that you and, and your family decided for your mom to pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, it was really just my mom and I, which was part of our, you know, like chosen path, I suppose, which is also why I say this all started before I came here for sure. Yeah, so she was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis when I was just 13, and she'd been misdiagnosed for about 10 years. So uh, unfortunately, she got you know very far along because there was many, many, a decade at least, if not more, of time not being properly cared for and tended to to her um, dis-ease. And, uh, and so what happens when you have primary progressive MS is you just consistently get worse. There's no relapse. There's no, you just decline. Um, and that will look different depending on how the MS arises in your body. For my mom, it was mostly in her leg on her left side. And so um, after 20 years of struggling with, well, fighting really with her own body because of this chronic disease, she wound up a quadriplegic, wasn't really able to move anything other than her face, not even really her neck anymore. She could, she's totally dependent on others, couldn't feed herself, couldn't bathe herself, couldn't get you know in and out of a chair on her own, absolutely nothing. And that's fine. There's lots of folks who are quadriplegics and live a beautiful, healthy, contributory life, but it was the pain factor. So she, you, you know, you could, you could, you could, you couldn't even touch her without it causing her pain. Her nerve endings were totally shot. She was just lying trapped in pain and totally mentally astute, 110% knocked off her social, you know, security number to me a few, few days before she died, like a hundred percent just trapped in pain. And you know, the medical community being the very Western scientific, I'm saying this in air quotes, <laughs> Western scientific uh, community, they um, they just didn't have a lot of tolerance for it because she wasn't actively dying. So they just didn't have a lot of tolerance for that situation. It's just like, well, she's alive. And I was like, this isn't living. Mm -hmm. That's the argument that this, this is where we're past this. She shouldn't have had to get here. She should have had enough support and physio and like all of the things up until this point over the like 20 years of being diagnosed and the 10, 15 years where she should have been diagnosed before getting here, that wouldn't have led us to this place. There should also be places where she can go and live and thrive in this state and get the care she needs. None of this exists. So as it stands, you know, this isn't a quality of life I would wish on my worst enemy. And it both my parents are quite spiritual. And so it also, I think was helpful that our spiritual belief was like, she's not gone. She just won't be right. on this plane anymore. But I don't know. I think even if I thought she was just gone, gone, I would still think that that was better when you get to the point where your only option is trying to find absence of pain. She, like she deserved to have freedom from that. And we did everything we could to give her that freedom on 
birth and it wasn't coming. And so, yeah, we had to argue. We had to bring in a medical ethicist to argue for her right. She wound up um, starving herself and dehydrating herself to death. That was the only legal option at the time for her to end her own life, which, which was actually pretty peaceful and something that some communities of color utilize in um, South Asia particularly as a means of ending your own life. And so I guarded her through that whole process, but the, you know, we had to fight with the medical community to let her do that and fight with the medical community to keep her um, properly out of pain as she did that, like make sure, because you know, you get to a point where you're not talking anymore. You want to make sure that that person is free from pain and they wouldn't agree. So it was a real like esoteric conversation about like, what is the purpose of medicine and them not agreeing on, I think many of them spiritual, or I don't even want to say spiritual, I'll say religious grounds that she didn't have the right to do that, that there was something wrong with that choice. And it was just, for me, always very clear that you get to decide. You have agency over your own physical self. And what was wild is you were, it was legal to committing, uh, dying by suicide, that act is quote unquote legal, but supporting someone who, who would like to uh, make that choice for themselves is not. I understand that's very layered and complicated in many, 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 many cases. Um, and can take you down some dangerous roads for sure. But in this case, it seemed pretty clear that she deserved to be supported. So, uh, and we weren't. And so, yeah, the argument for me was having to spend time and energy and emotional labor fighting for her right to die with dignity as opposed to just being able to be present with my mom in her last days on this earth, which I'll never yeah. get back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and about. how that was all complicated by our blackness. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much respect for you and that, and that experience. And I'm speechless because I can't even fathom going through that as a daughter and, you know, just someone who has dealt with so much pain as well. And, and sh the main thing I will say is that your mom was, is, and always will be so lucky to have you and that support and that bond will live on forever. And I'm absolutely sure that her spirit lives on through your work and none of these things that you need to hear, but that's just <laughs> coming through me right now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think it's so important to highlight and we have so many, lis so many listeners who suffer from chronic illness, chronic pain and don't feel heard, don't feel seen. And then this whole other layer that you're talking about with, with being black women and there's a lot that needs to change in the medical system. That's for sure. Yeah, in all systems, but that's one that right. we have identified very, very clearly. And um, again, like this was happening in Canada. And I know, you know, I always said as a, as a kid, we grew up in Vancouver and most of my family um, is American and had a lot of family just two hours south of the border. You just drive two hours, you're, you know, you're in the States visiting your family. And I was like, if we had been in the States, I would not be sitting here with you. I would have had to have 10 jobs taken out just to be able to get my mom like the bare minimum, right? Healthcare that she needed. I wouldn't have been able to go to law school. I mean, nothing's impossible. But it would have been very hard. Like the odds would have been very much stacked against us from that one issue. And then of course, just the issues that we had to face as a result of being black and her pain not being taken seriously. And, you know, the statistics around, for example, black women in childbirth are absolutely atrocious in the United States. It's I think three times more black women are three times more likely to die because of childbirth related issues, irrespective of class. Doesn't matter. Throw it out the window. And in New York City, it's 12 times, 12 times more likely to die than a white woman. That is egregious. Yeah. Um, and that's just that one stat. There's so many more we don't, we don't talk about or discuss. Um, and we can know those stats, but like, what are we doing about them? And what's the root of those? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's so much there. That is, that is so fascinating and, and such a part of your story. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Let's take a second to talk about CBD. I am a huge fan of CBD. Cured nutrition is my go-to. I think probably the most frequently asked question on my Instagram, aside from about all of my particular health issues and healing, would be, do you take CBD, Jordan? And which CBD do you recommend? Which one is safe? Will it get me high? What even is CBD? Ranges of questions. And 
Cured Nutrition is my number one favorite. You can use the code BLONDE for a discount, and I highly recommend that you do so. I've had the founder, Joseph Sheehy, on the podcast not too long ago. If you want to listen to that episode and learn more about the company and their mission, one thing that I've been particularly impressed by with Cured, especially because of the topic of this episode and Rachel's work that she has dedicated her life to as a racial justice educator, I'm really impressed with Cured Nutrition's response to everything going on in the world right now and the Black Lives Matter movement. So they have partnered and they sent out all these details about it to all of us who work with them with the Last Prisoner Project. There are currently over 40,000 prisoners incarcerated for marijuana-related offenses. And despite marijuana reform, there are still more arrests for cannabis possession each year than for all violent crime combined. So unfortunately, communities of color continue to be disproportionately subject to marijuana enforcement practices. I'm sure you guys have seen the petitions circulating around, especially lately on social media, innocent lives rotting away in prison because of a marijuana offense. Marijuana, which is now legal in many states, versus these violent crimes. I mean, I could go on and on, but it's not okay. So I am very, very, very impressed and proud to be partnered with Cured Nutrition, who is now working with The Last Prisoner Project. As far as CBD itself goes, I am a huge fan of CBD. CBD is amazing for anti-inflammatory purposes, for stress release, for sleep, for our joints and our muscles, those of us with chronic pain due to Lyme disease or anything else, it helps me so much. I actually rub my Cured Nutrition Pain Salve, which is like minty and it's full of shea butter. It comes in this really easy kind of like deodorant type of um, packaging or what's the word I'm looking for? Container. It's just really easy. It rolls right onto the skin. I use it every day. I especially use it before I sleep. I rub it all over my back, my jaw, um, my hands, all of my common pain points. And it helps so much with tension and beyond. I also take their sleep supplements. They have nootropics. They have so many different amazing products. So check them out. Use the code BLONDE for a discount. I feel like I could go on and on, but I'll continue talking about them as always. Check them out, support them, curednutrition.com, code blonde. Enjoy. And now let's get back into this episode with Rachel. I want to talk more about your work with spiritual activism. And for people listening who may not know what they would find within your courses and your work, could you share more about that with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So spiritual activism uh, for me is um, a really important and critical, especially in this moment, um, way to move about understanding oppression, um, all systems of oppression, but obviously I always highlight racial justice. So we, again, under systems of like cis, pet, white supremacist capitalism, learn this left brain analytical neck up way of of undoing i'll call it or addressing these issues and that's certainly uh important like i'm an attorney i guess that i can do that all day but i don't think that that's where real change comes from i think real change comes from this embodied approach and i think you can read a million books and you can go to a million classes and you can learn a lot and i think a lot of people have learned a lot but if it isn't resonating in every cell of our body change isn't going to happen it's like you're going to watch you know people who watch a um shocking documentary about veganism they'll watch it and be like oh my god i have to be vegan last two weeks right that's like human nature like we're like oh i've done it myself oh my god i can't and then you yeah change is really hard we're very dynamic creatures like it's Mm -hmm. you can have that intention i talk this a lot like tension doesn't really matter you can have that intention to keep it and to like really understand it on a cellular level that's what's needed to actually insight change and you have to see yourself in it you have to see that racial justice isn't about quote unquote, communities of color. This is about everybody. And you have to have an understanding that like this is healing for everyone. And 
so for me, that requires us to uh, do it in a heart-centered, embodied way. And so my approach is through uh, using culturally informed and honoring the cultures from which those uh, practices uh, originate forms of spiritual practices to help us, their gifts, right, that have been given by ancestors to support us in embodying this work. So meditation, breath work, pranayama is huge um, for me to really allow us to, all of this is grief work also. The reason I was talking about my mom and grief and all of that before is that all of this is grief work. I don't care who you are, where you come from, what you look like. We have trauma and grief around oppression. Of course, there's scales to that. And I don't mean that in terms of like the oppression Olympics. I just mean it looks different depending on whether you're oppressed or oppressor. And I talk about this a lot as well. Like all of us carry some oppressed oppressorship identity. Like I am a black woman identified person. And so as a result of that, I'm oppressed by white supremacy. I'm oppressed by patriarchy. I'm cisgendered as well. Um, so that's a privilege I have. It's being cisgendered. I have a privilege of being neurotypical. I have a privilege of being thin. I have a, you know, I have a lot of privileges and all of these are interconnected and it's really important for me to have a whole understanding of where I sit and have an understanding of the fact that I am an oppressed oppressor. And this is a big one for white women in this moment to have that understanding. Like, yes, you are oppressed as a woman identified person who is oppressed by patriarchy. You also oppress people of color. That's just a fact. So let's really lean into that and utilize that knowledge that you have of oppression. Utilize that knowledge that you have to an understanding of what it means to be an oppressor to others. Um, and that's why I think in this moment, women identified folks are more open to this conversation and to making that change. I mean, I also believe in divine feminine and that's, that's what's needed um, to course correct all of this toxic masculinity and heteropatriarchy. And so we are, we are the ones who will be leading the way, but to crack our hearts open to that, that, that existence of oppressed oppressorship and understand um, that none of us can heal and none of us can be free until all of us can be. And so what's actually going to be required for that is this deep inner work. And that inner work requires us to face our shadows, mm -hmm. to really look at ourselves. And it's the hardest work. It's why people don't do it. Um, you'd rather just read a book and be like, okay, got it. Like, you, know, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't got it. And you're actually oh, no. never going to get it. We all came, I believe, to this planet to have our souls having human experiences we decided to be in these skin sacks for lack of a better word mm -hmm. at this time to be part of this change and so we're but we're not here to get it we chose to unlearn so that we could come here and, and contribute um and so it's not a goal even or a destination like you're not going to get there this is life long work you peel back one layer and then it's like an onion there's just another deeper layer and you're like i didn't know that this murky shit was in me right. and it's this act of like all of us are steeped in this soup of oppression it's no one on this planet has existed and it's like in a way that we haven't known this i mean i don't want to say no one because obviously i haven't been everywhere um and there are certainly societies that are matriarchal but overarchingly right the majority of us live within this toxic sludge of white supremacist cis hetero ableist um homophobic transphobic capitalism and it's really harming all of us and so this work is taking a deep look inside and figuring out what's my shadow piece, what has prevented me from doing this work, what are the obstacles that are preventing me from moving forward and actually creating change. And then the purpose of that is not to just like sit on a rock and be like, okay, I meditated today so I contributed to racial justice because I think that's bullshit. But the point is for us to do our own inner work so that we have the capacity to get out there and actually show up for others and create change. That's what we're seeing now. That's the difference. We're seeing people who are like really committed to and owning up. I don't say owning up. Um, filling their space, claiming their space to their own healing and have done that healing. And so they can take to the streets and hold space for others and really, truly demand change because you know that there's another world possible when you're able to really face your own shadow and have this embodied notion of like, things don't have to be this way. Like I said at the beginning, we didn't have to get here. We're here now, but this isn't, this is all an experiment. We didn't have to get here. It's where we are. And so what are we going to do in this moment? And I'm not knocking you know, reading books and doing things from the neck up. I think it requires um, a whole bunch of different ways of going about it. I just think if we aren't also incorporating this piece of really getting into our heart space, which oppression tells us not to, they don't want us in our heart space. They don't want us healed because they know that that's how revolutions happen. They mm -hmm. know that if we know that we can heal ourselves and that we're going to support one another, like, you know, that top 1%, the people who hold all the power and privilege, it's going to fall. It's going to fall. So they are scared as right now mm -hmm. because they see it and they witness it and they should be scared 
You right. should be scared. This is really <laughs> yeah. happening. Right. Yeah. And so it's a beautiful thing. I think, again, I- I've known that this is my purpose for a very long time. And I was really wondering how all of these elements were going to come together with my um, um, spiritual trainings and my attorney uh, training and uh, all of my various, you know, ways of being. And, and this is it. And we're in this moment of like, this is it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this is, this is the healing. This is why, this is why we're here. And I don't mean that to say like, well, we had to experience this. I really don't think it needed to be this way, yeah. but this is where we're at. Absolutely. Yeah. So where can, where do you think people should start if they're looking to make that inner change, but they have no idea where to begin because they've just been so blind to it for so long. Where would you say they should start? I mean, I'm going to say start by taking my workshop. I'm going to say start by that. taking my webinars. Like mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. And, I, and I also am always very clear that like this, I think that that's a really great starting place, um, but absolutely not an end place. And that it's also incredibly important that people are learning from Black women in this moment, specifically women and femme-identified people and Indigenous women and femme-identified people and not just one many of us, like I have specific medicine that I can give you that I obviously think is really important or I wouldn't do what I do. Um, and there are so many other women who are giving medicine. And even if you don't like it, I mean, you're not really going to like my webinar. I would say if you, I don't know, you can speak to this better than me. I don't know what it is to be a white woman who takes my webinar, but I wouldn't say like, I loved that. I did Um, though. I did. It wasn't easy. And there was a lot of like emotions that came up of I just can't believe how blind I was and, um, and things that I do that are, you know, so unintentionally emotional violence as you teach. Mm -hmm. And that felt horrible. So none of that, I didn't love that, but I, (laughs) (laughs) I love awakening and I love becoming a better person. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So yeah, there's a reason that I did 101 twice and that I did 102 twice because there was so much yeah. as a white woman to wrap my head around that obviously was so unintentional because I do believe I'm a good person, but the harm, you know, that's been done even ancestrally. Yeah. Crazy. So yes, it's not fun, but I believe it's possible to still love it because right. I love being a part of this revolution and i think that that is what we're experiencing now i'd be interested to hear if that's what you see we're experiencing mm-hmm. now because all of a sudden and as you say it's it's centuries late and what took so long and it's so frustrating but it's happening i think yeah. so yeah yeah i think it is i think it is although i'm okay and i will say i i said this when we were like uh, like late March. So when we were early on in the pandemic, I experienced grief again. Like I hadn't after since after, right after my mom died. So my heart, my heart physically hurt for two weeks. Like I had to like rub it. Like it felt like, and anyone who's experienced like, you know, a deep loss, most of us, I will say have experienced a deep loss. And because of the way we are socialized, wouldn't even have had the, the kindness of being able to sit with that as grief. So that's also why I say that it's really important that we sit in the fact that this is grief work and to tend to ourselves as we do this. Um, cause it's not easy and you will feel a lot of grief, but you'll also feel a lot of like joy and awakening and all of those other things. Um, but when we were in early days is what I will say of, of the pandemic, I felt grief, like it took my breath away, like my heart physically ached. And that was because I knew where this was going as much as I can say that. And I don't say that like analytically, my brain was trying to really wrap my head around all of this stuff and like, you know, fill in the gaps of uncertainty because our minds will do that. So cute. Um, but I felt it in my, in my gut and my deepest sense of knowing and my empathic and intuitive knowing of like, okay. Uh, and just being a black person, I was like, so this is going to fuck black people up. Like without question, this is going to harm people of color, first and foremost, specifically black and indigenous folks. Latinx people will also be very, very much harmed by this um, because that's, this is just going to exaggerate the inequities that currently exist. So I literally just kind of like envisioned mounds of black bodies. Like that's what I was seeing, just like black bodies, black bodies. And then not too short, not too long after that, that's what we saw. Statistics started to come out about like who's, who is being the most disproportionately impacted by this. And I was like, yep. 
Um, but what I didn't know at that time was that I was also anticipatorily grieving this. And so, and I had said this, if you go back to my posts from like late March, I said very clearly, like, this is a collective awakening and like the revolution will happen. My understanding at that time, again, intuitively, like the revolution will happen because we, and specifically black people at that time are being left out to dry. We have been hung out to dry, especially in America. And I am Canadian, but I have black family members in America, frequent America. Um, a lot. America is specifically hanging black people out to dry and, and we're in the midst of, of a pandemic. And so you're going to leave us to starve. You're going to leave us to be houseless. You're going to leave us to, uh, you know, I was talking about medical racism before, like not even if we get ourselves to a hospital, have access to a hospital, we'll be treated differently once we get there. And people had to make these like, you know, life or death choices about who was going to get care and who was not going to get care. And I can tell you as a black person, I know I will not be the person who gets care all of these things. And so I was like, you're going to leave us with zero choice. Like you're going to leave us with so little people who have nothing, have nothing to lose. Right. And so I was like, and that's where the revolution will come because people will have nothing to lose. So catch us out in these streets because it's about to happen. I didn't anticipate it occurring in this way. And that was hard. Anytime you're witnessing, you know, massive black death in black deaths, I call this a black genocide. And like the the pandemic already had turned into one, not because of the nature of coronavirus, because of the social structures of oppression that exist that created a disproportionate impact on black folks. Not like we have some inherent defect or genetic flaw that makes us more susceptible to dying from coronavirus. No, these are social, systemic, institutional consequences of racism, of having less health and more health disparity because of our stress levels and because of institutional harm and medical races and all these things that go back centuries. Right. Um, so we were seeing all of that. And then to see this pandemic within a pandemic and to see, to have this moment of collective awakening in this white gaze shift in this way, because there's, there's, there's nothing else to turn. It's really, I don't say nothing else. It's really hard to turn away from right now. You can't just go back to work. You can't go watch your basketball game or your football game. You can't even really like just go chat with a friend or like go to dinner. Like you like this is it and so this was really important that it had to happen this way um clearly again it's really frustrating and really sickening and sad to me that we had to get here but we are here i'm really 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 incredibly beyond proud to be a black person and to see the ways in which black people are resilient um because we've been forced to be and the ways in which we are paving change and leading the way not just for black people black lives matter is not just about black lives, right? But when Black Lives Matter, everyone's lives are uplifted and can be better and do better. And this is about Black liberation. And it, when there's Black liberation, there's liberation. There's there's healing across the board. So I see an opportunity and truly hold on to the hope that this can lead to real lasting change. I'm really ex- excited by what's happening with defunding police and the fact that that's even being paid attention to. And like Minneapolis has gone ahead with that decision and hopefully other um, places around the world will also do that. That's, that is fucking huge. And I am a black person, so I don't hold my breath for anything. (laughs) No, I've seen too much harm. I've seen too much like, we care about this. And then nothing really come of it. Or I've seen it be used as a moment, like the amount of brands and businesses who are reaching out to me to like align themselves with black lives matter and basically commodify it is Mm -hmm. absolutely disgusting. Yeah, that um, is so frustrating. It's so frustrating. And so and so we'll see. I couldn't do the I talk about this a lot. I could not do the work I do if I did not have hope. Like how mm-hmm. how could I? Whether I I and I talk about this with my guides a lot when I channel, like I am unattached to the outcome. Do I believe that it's gonna happen in my lifetime? No, not really. Am I hopeful that like that? have we been making change? Absolutely. Will we continue to make change? Absolutely. Are where we are we where I want us to be? Absolutely not. Will I continue yes. to like push and challenge and be like not enough, not enough, not enough? so I can help get us all there. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to be a mirror for everybody, for myself included. This is very hard work for me. Mm -hmm. I have to hold myself accountable. I have to walk the walk. I'm not here for fame and fortune. I'm not here to have a million fucking followers on Instagram. I am here to show people their shadow side so that we can all heal. I believe that that's possible. I know you talk about human design sometimes. I just got into human design. I was just going to ask you what you Yeah. So I'm a projector. Oh, um, projectors. Yeah. And I've never met a reflector that I know of. So hi. Oh. <laughs> now we know um, each other. Fellow yes. energy beings. Um, but my, I'm not so great with the terminology. My cross? 
incarnation cross. My incarnation cross is to bring about heaven on earth. I wow. think it's the right cross of Eden. Yeah. Wow. So like this is my this is why I'm here. Look at you. And I had been, you know okay. been here in many lives doing this for many many lives, but I've chosen to be here now very very specifically to like uh, re- like we could really get it right this time. Like actually, actually. I um, love how I'm. Yeah. So I'm an idealist. It really nice. frustrates people, but I couldn't I couldn't push as hard. I couldn't challenge yeah. us all, myself included, this hard if I wasn't like I know we're here and I know we came from here and yes I want to congratulate us for that but like I don't want us to sit around congratulating ourselves too long we have so much further to go and I want us to continue to keep our eye on the prize whether we and our bodies get there or not you know I'm also mindful of my future children my future ancestors and the world that we leave behind and what kind of world they're gonna be able to have my husband works in climate change and that's a very serious all of these things are interrelated like if it wasn't if it this is being uh being really put under pressure cooker um, because the reality is, as I understand it, uh, we don't have a lot of time unless we really course correct. The planet is not going to allow us to continue to get it wrong. It's just okay. not, not going to be possible. So um, so we're running on borrowed time and we'll see. We'll see. I hold hope. I've gotten chills so many times since you've been speaking. I mean, it's true. And these are things that are terrifying to think about as a human. Such important things. And we are running on borrowed time. So, wow, your work is so important. Love that you're a projector, living out <laughs> your truest alignment. I want to know everything about your chart. That was something I was going to ask you. Do you also know your astrology, your sun rising and moon signs? Yeah, I'm a Virgo. I'm like a real Virgo. Um, my rising is Taurus. My moon is Gemini, which I'm only really getting into the moon now. Yeah. But I'm a real earthy. Earthy, earthy, earthy. Yeah. 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 Taurus. So we're pretty much the opposite because I'm (laughs) all air and Um, water, no earth, um, fire. And well, a little bit of fire like elsewhere on my chart, but super airy. And yeah, I really vibe with the earthy, fiery people because it's just a good balance with everybody, obviously. But yeah, is fire and earth. Um, oh yeah. My husband's yeah. water. It's very, oh, love yeah, it. it's helpful. It's cancer, cancer, water. cancer, cancer. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'm yeah. a cancer moon. So I feel that on such a deep, like emotional level. Yeah. Wow. Very emotional people. Totally. So before we let you go, which is about to happen, cause I know you have a busy life and you need to take care of yourself. I just want to quickly for a second, talk about your channeling because you mentioned it and I love talking about channeling. So could you just share a little bit about how you speak with your guides or even give tips for people who want to get into channeling? For me, it comes, it, I mean, it's so specific in person to everybody and it comes in different ways, but for me, it really comes through rest. So they actually, like my dreams, I'm a vivid dreamer, kind of always, always have been. My mom comes to me in my dreams all the time. When things get really intense, it's like, I won't, you know, I won't, won't have slept meaning I was working in other planes while I was sleeping. So I'll wake up exhausted, just like, ah, was all over this universe last night. I'm, you know, I need a, a, a break. I need to sleep from my sleep. So that has been big. And so having like a routine around what, what sleep looks like and means I've also really become more in tune with when I wake, I've been having trouble sleeping for the first time in my life. Like I've never had problems sleeping. And then the last like six months I've had problems sleeping and I'm realizing it's my, it's my guides. Like I'm waking up and they're trying to tell me something and I, you know, haven't, haven't been listening. And I'm finding that's actually more energetic around like who I've been talking to in the day or something that arose that I'm consciously not observing or processing. And I, I now have realized it's my guides being like, this isn't it like pay attention like this is not aligned so since i've recognized that i've been sleeping so that's really great mm-hmm. um i use a lot i rely on a lot of my healers um specifically healers of color who come from you know eons of um ancestral indigenous wisdom um to support me in meeting with and communing with my ancestors and um in my last session last week harriet tubman mlk malcolm x Honor truth like everybody came and this light being that was like it felt like um like an original is what I kind of wanted to call this light being like it was just this cool light thing yeah and um and I was like well, are these really 
here right now? Like, am I, and it's my ego in this. Like what's happening? Like Harriet Tubman is here to have a chat with me. She's pissed by the way. And they, they were just like, you know, you know why you're here. You know that I, we, you know that I am you and you are us and you're continuing the work and um, get over it, get over yourself. It's not about you and just keep doing it. And, and for me to be able to commune with them requires, but they also told me you need to rest. They always tell me that you need to rest more. You need to rest more. You need to rest more. And whenever I ask like, how can I connect with you more, hear you more? They're always like, uh, rest. If you rested more, you could hear us more and you could connect with us more. So just keep resting. Yes. Um, so stillness as much as that's possible. And again, these systems of oppression don't, um, they specifically teach us not to be still and that there's something wrong with being still. It's very important. I personally meditate, but I think that and meditation can look very different depending on who you are and what you what works for you. Stillness, I will just say, stillness. Actually, finding time to 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 listen to yourself. You know, our guides are talking all the time. Your intuition talking all the time. It's also one of the big things I think is really imperative and integral to the work of spiritual activism and getting into your body to understand social justice is you get to reconnect and reignite with your intuition and know that like you actually have known all this all of this time you were disconnected Mm -hmm. and you weren't acting on it and that we were socialized and programmed to do that yeah but that our guides are here and they're so potent right now i mean like they are here and they have a lot to say yeah and that they're just that the trust of knowing that they're here and that they're talking to you whether you're aware of it or not like i don't have I don't hear my mom. I don't have conversations with my mom. It's more a feeling. It's more um, signs. Like I'll ask for signs sometimes. I see numbers all the time. So 11, 11, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, all the time. And just knowing that, that, that that's something, that that isn't happenstance or coincidence or, um, you know, that those, those mean something to be able to find enough stillness in yourself to notice. Yeah, the signs are huge. I'm a huge number person also. Like my guides come to me in numbers. 201 is my main number. Mm. Right now it's 102 here in California and we're talking mm. about it. So it's it's literally everywhere. But that's beautiful. That's such good info for people. And I mean, yeah, even helpful for me to hear. I love hearing how people channel and how people connect. And I would also say in terms of this work of, of, you know, dismantling systems of oppression and committing to and um, firing up your own commitment to um, living out racial justice is knowing that you can call on your guides to support you in doing that. And and again, to me, that's spiritual activism. Like, that's really helpful because this is healing work. It's really hard. It's really, really hard um, for white folks to sit with the realities of what you haven't turned your mind to yet. Right. And so, um, and what that identity shift that comes with that learning and unlearning, like that's freaking major. And so to call in your guys to be able to support you with that work is, um, I think really, really important. I totally agree. And I just had to check because I was almost positive, but I, I'm correct. You have currently of 201,000 followers on Instagram and 201. That's like, Oh, right. Oh. Number. And that number might sound like crazy to you because you said you've quadrupled so quickly, but 201,000 and it's just going to keep growing. So that's, that's another message from our guides for sure that we are talking today because the 201 story is for, I will tell you another day, but it's pretty special. Cool. I'm so happy that you're here. Tell everybody where they can find you, where they can support you, all the things. Yeah, um, so you can find me obviously on Instagram at I am Rachel Ricketts, R A C H E L R I C K E T T S. My website, www.rachelricketts.com. Um, you'll find my spiritual activism webinars on there in the shop. I also highly suggest signing up for my newsletter comes out twice a month one is like a soul offering there's always some soulful prompts for um doing this work from the inside out and then the second one that comes out is a reparations roundup so we can as a community work together towards redirecting funds redistributing wealth in support of black and indigenous women and femmes so highly highly suggest heading there um, i also have a list of free anti-racism resources and free grief resources because like i said these are very tied topics um and i update that I don't want to say frequently, but it gets updated. <laughs> um, so check back. It's very thorough. I mean, it'll take you a long time to get through. And that resource list includes 
specific uh, resources for uh, women of color and women of color is healing. There's specific resources for folks who identify as mixed race, which I am a mixed race black woman. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of um, workshops at the bottom of webinars by other um, black anti-racist educators. Because like I said, um, I obviously appreciate folks coming to me, but I am not the only one, nor should I be. There's so many of us and it's really important to continue this work and to learn it from different people and different perspectives. So that's that's where you can find me. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing with us. This was such a good conversation and I just want to honor you so much for taking the time to talk to me, especially during this absolutely heightened time of just being busy and being everywhere and astral traveling in your dreams and all the things. So thank you for, for chatting with me on this podcast today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much, Rachel, for coming on the podcast. That was such an enlightening episode. I'm so grateful to have had her on. She's incredible. Um, I want to honor her again for saying yes to coming on this show because I know she is honoring her energy boundaries right now and um, only saying yes to things that feel like an absolute yes. So I just want to honor her for taking the time to talk to us, to educate us, to chat with us, to inspire us. I left this conversation feeling so inspired. I feel inspired to continue doing this lifelong work to use my platform to elevate voices in wellness and spirituality that have been marginalized. And honestly, what I've learned from her work is is too much to even say. I feel that you should do her spiritual activism 101 and 102. Um, but just simple things. I mean, they should be simple, but they're not. Things that I've learned about white supremacy, emotional violence, um, white fragility, cultural appropriation. I've been guilty of all of these things. In fact, anyone who's not a person of color has been, and we all have a lot of unlearning to do. It doesn't mean that we are not good people. It doesn't mean that we are hateful. It doesn't mean that we have tried in any way, shape or form to be racist. But what I have learned is that it's not enough to not be racist. We need to be actively anti-racist and actively in allyship. And her courses have taught me so much. It's also a comfortable space. Well, uncomfortable work, but a comfortable space where there's people asking questions. Um, it's pre-recorded webinars. So you can feel like, okay, I'm not the only person who had that question. I'm not dumb or ignorant or any of these things. This is just something that I'm now working toward and, and working toward learning and unlearning. So long story short, support her, check her out. Um, this is not a moment, like she said, this is a movement and we're all in this together and it's time to end this, end this madness that no longer needs to go on and and we will be the change. So I'm super grateful for her and for her work in this world. Obviously, I connect with her on many levels with channeling, with spirituality, with speaking to her guides and her angels and much of which she talked about in this episode. And like I told her when we got off the recording, I wanted to talk to her for hours, but I wanted to be really mindful of her time. So if you would love for Rachel to come back on in the future, please let me know. And hopefully one day we can make that happen again and go deeper with her. So I want to thank you guys for listening, for being here, for being open. I know that we are all going through a lot emotionally right now. I want to highlight that those of us who are white are not going through it in any sort of way, shape or form that black people or people of color are going through. But we are all as a human body going through a lot between the pandemic the tragic killings of many black people, um, you know, the worldwide unrest and arguing about all of this. And even if you're not affected personally by any of these things, which I'm not sure how that would be possible, but even if you were, um, we are all empathic beings. So we are all soaking in this energy. 
And um, I want to just note, it's important that if you discover Rachel through this episode, um, please do support her and follow her. Do not bombard her with DMs or questions. It is not her job or her place or her position to educate any of us because she is simply having her human experience and she's created so many things to educate us. That's part of what she does, her work in this world. So buy her courses and support her and check her out and also check out the resources on her website to continue learning from other educators and people whom she recommends. That's something that I've been doing as well. And yeah, I just want to acknowledge that I am... I am new to this work and I am not going to pretend that I'm not. So I'm always open to learning more, having these conversations. I want to have these conversations. I want to be part of this change and be a better person um, all around. So that's my commitment. And I also want to thank our sponsors for today's episode, Hum Nutrition, code SOUL for 20% off and Cured Nutrition, code BLONDE. For a discount there and please do come say hi on instagram facebook all the places if you feel inspired to rate and review the show it helps a lot with visibility and um just overall is something that i appreciate very much so if you take time out of your busy full life to rate and review the podcast on iTunes and send me a screenshot to jordan at thebalancebond.com. I will gift you my Soul on Fire yoga ebook for free. And I'm super grateful to do that. So all you have to do is rate and review the show. Send me a screenshot to jordan at thebalancebond.com. I'll thank you personally. I'll send you the free gift and uh, it will be much appreciated. So all of this to say, thank you for being here. I appreciate you all. We are all navigating these waters together. Rachel is leading a movement. I am so happy and honored to have had her here. And I hope everyone has a soul on fire day. Sending you so much love and we will talk next week. Mwah.